cue cards? What? You got the cue cards? No, please oh. will not talk to me at all. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, hey guys, for everyone that's watching online, we're coming to you live from uh, ASU Demo Day for the Electrical Engineering School. So throughout the day, we'll have um, teams come and interview. They'll tell you and give you a five minute um, presentation about what their project is and all the stuff that went into it. So it should be really exciting. And so we'll start off right now. Hi, my name is Toby Myers. I'm with the GPU Communication Systems team sponsored by General Dynamics. Also, my team is Mike Doyle, Larry Justice, and Lighte Sun, and our mentor is David Ramirez. So first off, you want to talk about what our project is? Yeah, so if you could just tell us a little bit about your project and yeah, yeah. Uh, what it entails and stuff. So go in your car, and there's a radio dial. You can listen to FM. You can only listen to one channel at a time. What if you could listen to every single channel on the radio at the same time, all the way from the left, all the way to the right? You wouldn't really care because all of the channels coming in, all the sound, it'd overlay and it wouldn't make any sense. But in the military, they do have some great applications for that. So with interpreting, if someone's on the radio, an enemy in the battlefield, you want to hear what they're saying. So right now, the military, they have to have 50 radio boxes, just like your car radio, huge ASIC boards. And each one is sucking power, using up space, getting warm. It's a lot. So what we did was we took a computer with a GPU and a software-defined radio receiver. I have two right here. Our first one was the HackRF1, our original one that we wanted to use. Um, unfortunately, with the HackRF1, there's not much documentation for it, and so we weren't able to use it very well. So our second one we had to use is the RTL-SDR. This is about a $20 software-defined radio receiver. And it's not as good as the HackRF1. You can't get the entire bandwidth, but radio issues, if you want, look it up, rtlsdr.com. <laughs> but ultimately, our project was on, GPU on um, GPUs in computers. Okay. So seeing if they're actually worth it. Because you can use them in power systems. You can use them in financial applications, anything. So we just wanted to see, are GPUs worth the cost? Okay. So we did two main methods. We did auto parallelization, which means you put in code that's not written in CUDA, the GPU programming language we used, mm -hmm. and it makes it automatically in CUDA. The second method is to take an existing C library and change it. Now, ultimately, we got two working prototypes that are all both able to do the entire radio spectrum of one signal. If we had a better receiver, we could do it more. And so we have two working products, but the auto parallelization one, super inefficient because it's a machine making it. You know, you yeah. haven't, you're not able to carefully craft it. Our other way was written in C originally. And so converting it from C to CUDA, that's like going from a straight line to kind of taking a line at the bank and making it multiple tellers. There's different types of things going on. And so it didn't really cleanly work. So ultimately in the future, if we were to redo the project, what we would do is we would completely handwrite the code from scratch in CUDA. Okay. So what do you think was the hardest part of your project? Uh, every single aspect. <laughs> the radio receivers, we thought it'd be easy, didn't work that how we wanted. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to overcome that. The CUDA auto parallelization, super tricky. We thought you just plug in the code and it makes it. No. Pain. Um, you have to set up all the software and even the company. So we used MATLAB's parallel processing package. They even had issues with the product. So when we finally got that to work, it was good and it wasn't efficient. So that was another hurdle. Okay. As far as writing the code, we wanted to just make the um, C code, just all CUDA, just change out some functions. Doesn't work like that. You have to have C in one part and CUDA in the other because the C runs on the CPU, the computer itself, and then the CUDA runs on the GPU, which is your graphics card. So kind of getting them to play together nicely and efficiently was not easy either. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all the time we have for this team. Um, so we'll be moving on to the next team, and thank you very much for coming and you. explaining your project. Um, I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Brianna. And I'm Gabe Corgan. And so can you tell us a little bit about your project, what it was, and um, how you guys got it working? 
<laughs> yeah, so right now, there's like a, there's a big need in the world for a safer security with a terrorism acts of crime. And so we use security screening checkpoints at airports right now, and they create long, inefficient lines. And we're also not very good at screening large areas in public places. Uh, if you can see the pictures, we, uh, we have a large public place and a, a, a long queue. So we're trying to develop a system that's able to see and detect concealed threats on people in a large public area might make lines more efficient. Okay. Um, so what do you think was probably the hardest part of your project? Uh, one of the most challenging parts of our project was the manufacturing. I mean, we had to, so we have a gimbal with our design, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. It's in the slides. Yeah. But when you're reflecting beams like that that you can't see, yeah. the slightest little step size can cause unwanted reflections in your beam. Mm -hmm. And something like that is going to mess up the image that you're scanning. So we had to manufacture a surface, a reflector that is as smooth as possible and stuff like yeah. that costs a lot of money. Okay. Um, I'll talk about it a little more later when we get through the slides, but we were very fortunate to get that manufacturing donated by a member of our team's family. Yeah. That must have saved you guys a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so you guys can proceed. Um, oh, okay, yeah. yes. Oh, me. Uh, so first we started with the simulations, and the idea of the simulations was just we're going to get all the reflectors or add in piece by piece. So we started with our source, which is our horn antenna, and a single dish reflector. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that first simulation is to find out where the focal point of our reflector is, because that's going to affect the beam that comes off of it. We then added in our second reflector, which is also our gimbal. That's that flat surface I was talking about, and shot that out onto our image plane. So that's mm -hmm. what the whole thing would be imaging. Yeah. And the idea of the simulations was just to get a feel for how far everything needs to be away, how they need to align with each other, and what angle the mirror needs to be tilted at in order to get that like about one centimeter pixel scan. Okay. So the next step is we had to construct our reflector. So we have a collector that focuses and changes the focal point of the terahertz wave. But then we also have to aim it, so we scan it across an array of pixels. Um, so we manufactured this reflector. It would have been really expensive, but we got it donated, thank you, thankfully. And then this, the next step with that was to connect motors to it and to control these motors using LabVIEW and coordinating each movement with our receiver. So here's a picture of the real setup. So you can see the, the terahertz transmitter. And then we have our collector, collecting dish, and then we have our reflector which moves, scans across the image, and you can see the target on the far right. So the results are, we first, this was one of the challenging parts also. We started with LabVIEW, and Gabe was our, our LabVIEW man. Okay. He uh, put a lot of time into reading the results coming from our scanner mm -hmm. and trying to turn it into a file that could then be put into MATLAB to make an image. Right. And LabVIEW was a little buggy. <laughs> it, um, yeah. it was having some issues. We used to have this beautiful GUI uh, so people could go in and change the pixels that it's scanning. But we're still using LabVIEW because we need it to read the, the scan. But we ended up using a lot of Arduino mm -hmm. in order to get everything functioning together seamlessly. So um, in the end, your product is working. And mm -hmm. um, what? What um, what do you think is the best thing that you got out of this project? What did you learn the most? There's a lot of different aspects. Mm -hmm. And each of us kind of had our own part of mm -hmm. it. Okay. So for me, it was learning FICO, which is an entirely different simulation software. Mm -hmm. But we also learned a lot about manufacturing, which we had never really gotten into. Mm -hmm. There was a lot to be learned. There was a lot to be learned, too, about um, w working as a team and working with a research professor. Because I have uh, I had an, an internship in industry, but never done a research application. Mm -hmm. That's completely different. And you guys learned how to work as a team and all, mm -hmm. all the fun that goes into that. Yes. OK. So um, I think that's all the time we have for you guys. Uh, thank you for sharing your project with us. And good luck today with your poster presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. <laughs> I guess the other team's not here yet. <laughs> <coughs>
just let that happen? <sighs> I kind of did. People. <laughs> oh, not, not Sean? No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I don't have the schedule on me. Mm -hmm. oh, he's out there right now. Oh, trying to find him? <laughs> Is this paused? Still live. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, with with them. Um. Okay. Thanks. Is this even a? Could, could you put the timer on? Or would that be possible? So I kind of alert you when they want over because we're trying to do like. Or yeah, it's just this uh, HDMI right here. So I had to go ahead and set up on that side. Now I just felt this one. All right. to see the are you just using this as the actual screen um, is it I'm, I'm able to pull the feed so if you talk about something we'll switch over to it but yeah. go ahead and keep it on yeah okay so um could you tell us a little bit about your project and kind of introduce what it is and how you guys got to this point right so our project deals with some of the circuitry that goes into satellite receivers and from the picture you can see here on the right this simulsat reflector which is a big antenna dish it's produced by Antenna Technology Communications Incorporated, and we did our project for them, and we dealt with a very specific part of this reflector. So it captures satellite signals from space, and then it reflects into a series of feed horns, 34 individual feed horns, and this is one of the feed horns right here. Um, this is just one of them. The signal comes in here, and it hits something called a planar ortho mode transducer, which is this little board here. And it's kind of sandwiched in between, let's see, yeah, so you can see 
that flat piece in the middle is kind of sandwiched in between the horn. And that's really what our project was focused on. Uh, focused on. This little flat piece it looks fairly simple, but there's actually a lot of embedded microwave circuitry in here. So this is the original board that was used by the company. Unfortunately, we don't have the board that we designed. They're still fabricating it, but we still have the original one, so it's okay. Um, our project was focused on creating a less lossy version of this planar orthromo transducer. And losses are very important in satellite applications because the signals you get are very, very weak. So you want to make sure that you're not losing any of it in the form of heat or whatever. So we designed a new structure. with It's called suspended strip line. And we minimized losses greatly. So the circuit we produced was much more efficient. And what that means in terms of commercial products is that you can get much higher definition TV quality um, when you stream TV. So that's mainly the application we were working out is commercial applications. There are other applications in government and whatever, but our focus was on TV streaming. Okay. Um, what do you think was probably the most difficult part of your project? So our project used a lot of simulations, a lot of empirical evidence from simulations. Mm -hmm. And for us being students still, we're, I mean, we're not totally proficient in some of these softwares. Right. Some of these softwares are very difficult, have a very steep learning curve. So for us, it was a lot of just learning the software, learning how to use it, learning how to run simulations and optimizations and layouts. So after we figured that out, it actually went pretty smoothly. And I think for us, it was really good because this is software we're going to use once we graduate and go into actual industry. Mm -hmm. So it was very helpful for us to be able to learn all of it. Yeah, it's better to learn it now than go and yeah, not be absolutely. able to do it. Um, so I guess if you could go back and do your project again, what are some things that you might change that might make the process go faster? Ah, yes. So there's something called requirements volatility. And it's basically being aware of what could change before it changes. So there were some things in our project and the company that commissioned it. They changed things up on us, so we had to adapt to that. But if we also would have kept in mind, oh, they might change it back or they might do this. So we probably should have had two concurrent designs working instead of going back and forth between designs. That's probably one thing we could have, we could have done, having multiple designs working. Um, yeah, that's probably a good change we could have made. Um, and then, what do you think this is going to, how would how'd this benefit um, current designs already out there? So, our project uses suspended strip line, which is kind of a niche uh, feature. Most use standard strip line. Um, so, I think if you could just get suspended strip line, make it more of the norm, because mm -hmm. it does perform a lot better, it's just a little more expensive. So okay. I think if that just becomes the norm in transceiver design, then you can just get higher quality all around the board through all companies, all receivers, all satellites. So yeah, I think that'd be one interesting thing to see. Yeah. And so you guys have still have your thing in fabrication. So if you were to have you know extra time to work on it, or you know an extra semester or an extra year, is there anything you would add to it that could make it better, or um, is there anything like that? that you could talk about? We actually finished this project about two months ago. So it really is all up to the company we did this for to fabricate it. We understand like we're just a senior design group. We're not really a top priority to them. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of taking their time making sure that they can implement it effectively before they produce it, which from a business standpoint, that makes sense. Yeah. You want to make sure you can actually implement it. So they're working with how to actually implement it into their current design. So they, they like the design, they like what they see, they still have to build it and test it. So, I mean, as far as the physical testing, we can only assume it's gonna work, but until we actually test it, we don't know. So it's really up to the company now to fabricate it and test it. Okay, that makes sense. So, okay, so that's all the time we have for you guys. Uh, thanks for coming and sharing your project with us and good luck with your poster presentation. Thank you.
So, um, yeah, this is good. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, tell us a little bit about your project and what you guys did. Okay. So, my name is Matthew Ullman. Uh, we were with General Dynamics Mission Systems. Mm -hmm. So, they were sponsoring, it's an industry sponsored project on deep learning. So, this was uh, for a this project was to deal with, it's essentially to help out TSA. So we created a algorithm that it helps with the detection of contraband materials at airports. So the reason why this is important um, is that it allows for a faster processing and it should lead to slower or to uh, shorter wait times mm -hmm. at uh, airports. So what this does is it takes the, the airport scan file and it takes, um, takes the airport scan file and it, we break it up and we spit it through an algorithm which will locate and identify which zone of the body the contraband is located in. So um, as you can see, it was, it was uh, hosted by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the competition was put out to a bunch of data scientists. Um, we decided to go for it. And so um, if we look at this, uh, we used a bunch of different resources for this. So we used Amazon Web Services, um, uh, we, or at least we tried to at the beginning. Yeah. Um, it ended up being, we ended up not using this in the end state just because uh, Amazon Web Services was uh, very hard to share data with different team members um, for. And then we ended up, General Dynamics gave us a, a computer with a GPU so that we were able to process because the, the, the neural network that we used for our algorithm is very computationally intense. And so to do that, we had to have some, it was a lot of processing power. So that's why the GPU, we were able to do that. Um, so with the, how we process this is, so the, as you can see here, there are 17 different body zones that the uh, Department of Homeland Security specified. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is we, took, we take these rotating image files that they give us, which give us 16 different rotations of the human body in these, uh, in these files. So you can see that's on the image on the right. Mm -hmm. um, so what we want to do is we, wanted, we initially wanted to divide it into the different body zones, crop them so you could see, okay, this this is just the arm and then we can go yeah. from there. Um, we ended up going with another method just because it, it actually uh, performed better and it was more universal where we included all of the body and we just, um, so, the, so this is the first method which we just, we tried to crop all of the, the images into their different zones and it wasn't super accurate. But the second method we did is we stacked all the relevant rotations that that zone was visible from. Okay. And so you were able to see this person has contraband in zone five, which is the upper chest. Right. And so you include all of the rotations where that zone is visible from. And so our algorithm was a convolutional neural network, which is a data science tool that takes a, um, it, it emulates a human brain. And so it forms connections between a lot of different, uh, between training data and uh, then it can, you can use it to make predictions on future data. So 
the how this works is it's essentially like a study guide at first where you provide it with training data and then you provide it with the answers of whether or not that file contained contraband in that zone. Okay. And so you train the network on to realize that and then it will form associations and form weights based on of that and then at the end of it you can input a file at the end mm -hmm. and make a prediction on how that works. Yeah. So yeah, so we have here, this is just like a, a, essentially like a brief example of how the CNN works is you feed it a bunch of different image files and you tell it what each one is and then eventually it'll be able to uh, correlate um, based on anomaly detection and like different edge uh, detection what, what correlates contraband or in this case, you know, like a, a cow, a chicken or a sheep, like it'll, it'll be able to, to uh, correlate different features with whatever classifiers you want. In our case, we use contraband and not. How we had to do this is we had to prepare our data into different folders yeah. and make the data ready to go into the neural network. And so we had to separate it based on whether or not it had contraband and which zone that was that had contraband or not. And so we were able to successfully do this and we stacked all of the images and we put it in the CNN and we were able to get good results out of it using both MATLAB and Python. So MATLAB, we, uh, we were able to get the best results out of that. For Zone 17, we got a, about a 98% detection accuracy. Um, so what is Zone 17? Is there a so, yeah, specific so body part? Yeah, so sorry. So Zone 17 <coughs> is the upper back. Oh. So that's, um, that's, we had a lot of actual images because that's typically where people would hide stuff. Yeah. In, the, in the, the test data that we have, like Zone 17 is very common for people to, to put things there. So there are certain zones like the legs and other areas where people are more, more prone to put uh, contraband items that have a better detection. Um, so we were able to get pretty good results with that. We did the upper chest in Python and we were able to get, we were able to get like satisfying results, like ones that met the minimum requirements, but it wasn't as good as our MATLAB results were. So what, what are your final results and um, what were you guys able to accomplish at the end? So we were able, zone 17 was definitely the best. We got a 98% accuracy. Um, and then, and that's the upper back. So that was with Python, that was with MATLAB. We were able to get that result. We were able to get the other zones were ranging from about 75 to 80% accuracy. Okay. Um, we did, we were able to, to, there are some ways that we could improve the project, um, if we were given more time, yeah. um, with, and that would just be like cropping out certain unnecessary parts for that specific zone or okay. using more rotations of the body. Okay. All right, well, thank you for sharing your project with us and good luck with your poster presentation. to work on stuff as well, and they're here to share what they did. So um, you could give us a little introduction of yourself and then what uh, your project was and tell us a little bit about that. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mike Lee. I'm an online student from down in Florida. Um, part of Team 9, uh, our project was a Morse decoder. Uh, basically, what we were looking to do is to take uh, Morse signals off the uh, airwaves, like recordings off the constant wave bands, um, take recordings just of different people all over the world, you know, who still use Morse, you know, on, over the radio waves, and to be able to tr translate that accurately uh, into text. So we started off, um, we have a GUI, pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, we started off with just decoding. Um, towards the end, then we actually added a section to where you can encode, like you can actually type in text and it'll turn it into Morse audio as well. Um, but it starts out, uh, all the recordings, they all have a lot of noise just inherently because, you know, coming off of the radio waves, um, mm -hmm. they all are pretty noisy. So we ran it. The first step is it runs it through a uh, FIR filter, a very high order filter. Uh, I believe it's 506th order, so it's a narrow bandpass filter. Then we use the fast Fourier transform to find the dominant frequency, and then we centered that filter around the frequency. So this this all happens automatically. It's it senses the dominant frequency and so centers the filter around it. 
um, sowing it with a, a fairly clean signal, you know, coming out of the filter. That's then turned into an array of ones and zeros, uh, just our binary output. Mm -hmm. And basically it just determines dots and dashes, what's a dot, what's a dash, what's a space. Um, from there, probably the most complex part of the whole project was determining, you know, we have our ones and zeros, but what's a dot, what's a dash, and that's all based on the length, you know, how long of a one we have. Same thing with the zeros, you have spaces between dots and dashes, letter spaces, word spaces, um, so basically three types of spaces. Um, we were using a method of constants first for the spaces, because that, that ended up being the hardest part. Um, and that basically just, we found constants that worked with 90% you know, of the, the recorded signals we could find. Um, we then started playing around with a method called k-means uh, through a MATLAB. That's a unsupervised machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ran into some issues with that, but that had the most promise. Um, definitely had the most promise just because it, it, there are no constants. It's fully adaptive. Um, and the last thing we, we noticed is that certain users, as they're typing Morse, their, uh, their tempo changes. So the okay. spaces actually, the length of the spaces actually gets less or, you know, actually gets faster or slower as they go. Um, so we were originally taking, you know, analyzing the entire signal at once. But we started doing an adaptive array, which actually just takes it bit by bit. So as the tempo changes, we can actually um, adjust for that. Okay. Um, so what do you think um, you would do differently in this project if you could kind of start over knowing what you know now? Um, to maybe make it better uh, or, you know, finish it faster or something like that? Definitely, I would have started with k-means. Um, we, you know, that ended up being, I think, where the, the, the future of this project would have been. Something that's fully, you know, because when you go online and you look up, you know, all these signals, some Morse operators are really good, some are not. Some are pretty inconsistent, you know. Uh, for example, the difference between a dot space and a letter space should be about uh, a letter space should be about three times the length of a dot space. Well, a lot of Morse operators, there, it's not exactly you know three times the length. So when you're mm -hmm. using constants, you run into issues. Whereas k means the that that would be the future of it. I mean, it's a clustering algorithm and it's very very accurate. Okay. Um, and then, I guess, what was the one thing you learned the most from this project? Maybe you or the whole team as a whole, um, what would you say that was? Definitely, uh, I'd say the value of a good team. Um, okay. um, well, we, we all, we bonded. The, the four of us got along from the get-go. Um, so honestly, I, I couldn't be happier with the way that turned out. We actually, we're friends, we'll probably keep in touch, in touch years from now. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Especially since you guys are online, um, you don't really know anyone besides, you know, uh, being, you know, spread out all across the U.S. So that is really cool that you guys were able to, you know, get along really well. Um, but that's all the time we have for you. Uh, thanks for coming on and sharing about your project and best of luck to you today during the presentations.
So um, if you could tell, introduce yourself, uh, your team, and what your project was, and talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, my name is Allison Schmid, and I'm a student at Arizona State University. Um, the rest of my team is made up of online students, Brett Long, Ben Strzok, and Daniel Sirico. And we designed an automated humidity control system for Arizona Foundation Solutions. Um, so what happens is when you run your air conditioning a lot, particularly as we do in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, the way that air conditioning systems are designed, they tend to pull air underneath the home. And when it gets there, it condenses, it causes the soil to expand, and then that leads to cracks in the foundation. Mm -hmm. So Arizona Foundation Solutions has a humidity control system in place, um, but they asked us to look into it and vamp it up a little bit, because um, right now they, the system that they're using runs all the time or it's all the way off. Mm -hmm. So we created an automated system where you set certain set points in the code and then based on the sensor readings, it'll cause the fan to turn on or turn off, okay. um, depending on what the set points are. So we have two sensors, one located underground and one located in the, um, on the outside to mm -hmm. measure the ambient um, humidity level. And then that communicates with this PLC, which then operates the exhaust fan. And then one of the nice things that we were able to do with the project is that we were also able to get the um, fan run data and the sensor readings mm -hmm. to upload to an external website. So if it's connected to the customer's Wi-Fi, then Arizona Foundation Solutions can monitor that data remotely okay. rather than having to go individually to each site and do a manual checkup. Okay, that's pretty cool. So it's kind of like if you have an AC unit and you can just set the temperature at different time intervals and it'll once it hits that interval, it'll start running or something like that. Right. Okay. Right. So you said that you are the only um, on-campus student, everyone else is online. So was that kind of hard to coordinate with everyone or is there was there a learning experience with lear uh, working with people that weren't physically here all the time? Sure. Um, it actually was not as difficult as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really have a whole lot of trouble getting people to, you know, be able to be in the sa at the same time in the same yeah. place for meetings, um, which I had initially thought was going to be a struggle. It, it actually wasn't. Um, when we actually came down to building and testing, it, it did get a little bit difficult because we were sending parts back and forth across the country, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, assembling things, you know, at once, calling each other hey, this isn't working, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a little bit troublesome, but, but we always worked together and we were able to resolve any issues that came up. Um, well, yeah, that's good. And um, so what do you think was probably the most difficult part of this project? Was it the having to send stuff all the way across the country or was there a, like a technical aspect of it that was more difficult than you guys had thought? Um, well, personally, I did not work on this type of thing in my internship. Mm -hmm. I didn't really explore it um, in my classes as an undergrad. So for me, um, most of the project was difficult. It was kind of a learning curve all the way around. Um, but it was very interesting. I think um, I definitely learned a lot, and I'm, I think it was a good experience. Um, and I think the purpose of doing the senior design projects is to get you that real world experience that you mm -hmm. might not necessarily get in a classroom. Um, so I am grateful for that. Um, I think as a team, probably the most difficult thing was the actual um, uploading to the external website um, okay. because this PLC had been designed um, pretty rigidly, mm -hmm. um, I would say. Um, so there was a specific pin that you had to, you had to change um, in order to get it to upload. and. They were not yeah. super responsive <laughs> yeah. when we asked them for help. So that was probably the most difficult struggle as a team. Okay. And I guess the final question is, um, if you had more time to work on this project, is there anything else you would add to it to make it better or something that you wish you had time to add to it? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the other things that Arizona Foundation Solutions would have liked to have had if we had been able to make it happen um, was the ability to communicate with weather services. So maybe then they could predict when there might be problems. Mm -hmm. um, again, that was something that they threw out there at the very beginning. We don't expect you guys to make this happen. If you can, yeah. it would be great. Um, the other thing um, that was conditional was that um, remote 
um, monitoring function. So we were able to accomplish that. We were not able to do the weather services, but okay. I think if we had had more time, maybe we could have explored that a little bit further. Okay. All right, well, that's all the time we have for uh, this team. Um, thanks for coming and sharing your presentation, or your, <laughs> your project with us, and uh, good luck with the rest of Demo Day. Thank you. Okay, um, so could you introduce uh, yourself and then what your project is and you know, tell us a little bit about what you guys have accomplished this semester, what you've learned, all that stuff. Okay, do you hold it yeah. or do I? Okay, <laughs> my name is Clint Lawler and I'm with uh, Lee Hassan and Tanner Haro and we worked with Garrett Scott of the microchip company okay. um, on a smart barbecue um, uh, enhancement. So basically we were to to pick a game that you'd play at a gathering, like a barbecue or something, and enhance it with microchips, microcontrollers. Okay. Um, so we went through a lot of different iterations, a lot of different ideas, mm -hmm. hit a lot of dead ends, and ended up finally choosing two games. Uh, one teammate, he, he focused mostly on building a, a large version of Jenga okay. uh, that senses when it falls over and mm -hmm. has an indication um, with some LED lights, and he's also connected it serial, you know, serial monitor to his computer, so it could uh, display some things on his laptop as well. Okay. Um, and I worked along with uh, my other teammate, and we built a tabletop version of Battleship, not not just a little small one like this. I like wish I could. Full it it fits full a whole six foot table. Okay. It's very okay, large. Very big one. And um, so. Um, do you want me to go further into details on how that works? Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so I brought with me today a one of the many ships. So, uh, and on the bottom we have magnets here. Okay. Okay. So when you start the game, each player has five ships of different sizes, mm -hmm. and he or she will place them on the board. And where the magnets line up, there's holes on the board so that these line up exactly right. And underneath, you can't see it. There are switches, they're called read, read switches, R-E-E-D, mm -hmm. basically in the presence of a magnetic field, um, this normally open switch will, will close. Okay. So as you put your ship down, those switches close. Mm -hmm. Now the a huge challenge we had with this is uh, a microcontroller is limited on its inputs and outputs, mm -hmm. very few, and each player has uh, 64 locations, uh -huh. so 128 inputs. That's just for where these sit. Then also there's the board where you're making the guesses. Um, that's another 128 right. inputs. So we're talking a lot of different inputs. So uh, we had a, the challenging part was figuring out how to make all those inputs fed into the uh, microcontroller, know where the status was, and, and create the programming so that when a person makes a guess and it's a hit, um, that it knows. Mm -hmm. And if it was a hit, we've programmed it as well to to play a sound. Um, oh, like a fun little explosion yeah. or something. Yes, like that. yes, yeah. exactly. We we purchased a a soundboard from Ada Adafruit, I think it's called, mm -hmm. and implemented that. And we also had some LED dot matrices, which indicate um, show where you've made the hit. So, say I've I've, I've guessed A one and I've made a hit. There is an LED light that will come on that says that I hit them at that location. So that's basically it. Okay. Um, so wh what do you, wh what was the one th thing that you learned from this experience that you think was uh, helpful for you in you know, future endeavors? Mm -hmm. uh, circuits was a huge one and um, I, I liked it, I liked this project because there was a lot of computer science involved as well, mm -hmm. programming. I've always yeah. wanted to get more into that, and this really forced me to dig really deep, do lots of studying, and uh, figure out how to make it work, and I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, programming is definitely a big field right now. Well, um, thank you for your time, and good luck with the rest of your presentation today. Thank you. So, um, you could uh, introduce yourself and um, your team, like what you guys did, and 
give us a little information on you know what you guys are presenting out there to the uh, professor and stuff. Okay, uh, my name is Ton, and um, I'm on a project with a microchip. It's uh, basically a field line autonomous painter. We call it short flap for <laughs> That's what it stands for. Uh, basically, it's an uh, it's an it's a painter that paints field lines and stuff like that, uh, parking lots, foot soccer fields, football fields, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you program program it to do, it pretty much does it automatically, uh, and um, that's basically what our project is. Okay, so you can you know put in the dimensions of the field and then where you want it to stop and paint, and it'll do that. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, did you have a video to yeah, show us? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a video because the, it's pretty heavy and it's out there uh, right. doing demos, so we yeah. just made a short video. Um, uh, I won't play it for a long time because it's, it's pretty long. <laughs> This is testing, the, basically it's, it's counting um, every turn that the wheels make each wheel uh, because uh, one of the challenges of this project was to make this thing go straight uh, as hard as it, it's as easy as it may sound to make something go straight, for a robot to go straight it's actually really hard because they individually control each wheel yeah. uh, and so, and the motors are not exactly the same uh, mechanically so when you put the same voltage you won't get out the same input mm -hmm. and that makes the robot tilt and turn and turn so basically we have to make a controller that reads the the, the speed of each motor yeah. and and adjust the motor correctly to make the machine go straight and you have to account for you know bumps and stuff exactly, in the, exactly. in yes, the concrete yes, and stuff yes. yeah. so you know about this yes yeah. exactly and and we use a, uh, a gyroscope to take care of all that stuff okay. yes and so right now it's it's basically it's just a demo painting a, painting a, a, a mini soccer field, a box with a circle in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we left the dripping on to show the route that it's moving so we can see all the right. turn that it makes and stuff like that. Um, that's pretty much what it is. Oh, well, it looks like it works pretty well. Yeah. Um, so what would you say was probably the uh, hardest part of this project? Uh, as I mentioned, the hardest part is to make the machine go straight. That was like the biggest challenge as far as, as the whole project goes. Uh, all the electrical and the body and the mechanical stuff, it's pretty easy okay. uh, for us, but uh, programming it to go straight, that, that was one of the biggest challenges because okay. it would veer off. Yeah. Um, so uh, what do you think you took away most from this project? Like, what was the one thing you learned a lot about that maybe you didn't know beforehand? Uh, <laughs> I guess the biggest challenge would be working with a team uh, of different people, of how putting everybody together, uh, you know, taking uh, l uh, little specialties from everybody to gather up to put together to create a project. It's, it's pretty tough uh, because we, uh, we try to incorporate all the specialties together to, to right. make a project, yeah. And, and I think th that was one of the biggest challenges besides uh, uh, programming the machine to go straight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming it's, it's fully functional right now um, with the being able to paint the mini soccer field. Is there anything that you would add to it if you had more time or, you know, um, that w could make it better or something like that? Um, right now, it's it's uh, it, this is uh, actually a uh, a demo model, so it doesn't print like a whole field. As, as you can see, we right, we have right. water to it. It's more of a proof of concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a concept thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 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 spraying out water at the moment. Yeah. But uh, if I was to do it, uh, I I would actually make actually make it paint real paint on, on actually an actual field, like maybe like a, a grass field or something like yeah. that. So that that's one thing that I would you know. Uh, yeah, that improve on that yeah that'd be pretty cool to see all right well um that's all the time we have for you guys um but thank you for coming and showing your project to us and best of luck out there with the rest of the presentation thank you
So um, could you kind of introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about your project? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Nathan Rodkey. I'm working on a, a low damage gas flow sputter module. Uh, what we did is we constructed an ITO electrode that has a magnetron in the back, and that magnetron works to confine a plasma with a, within a ring. And that's what you see here on this green sheet is the magnetic fields on top of this electrode. So I'm just going to give a few pictures uh, showing what we did. Uh, we had to build an impedance matching network to match the, uh, the power output or optimize the power output of our, of our device. And these are, are some pictures of what that looks like. It's two capacitors and uh, an inductor put into a box. Um, we made a graphical user interface to control these, uh, the positions of these capacitors. And uh, we then went over and constructed these electrodes. And here's an example of what the, the magnetron assembly looks like. A bunch of neodymium magnets put into an array. Um, here's an example of what our, our stack looks like. And then we went ahead and even uh, ignited a plasma. And that's a, an argon plasma with our ITO electrode. Okay. Could you give uh, the audience a little bit more detail on you know what this could be used for in you know um, applications and stuff like that? So sputtering is used widely in microelectronics and PV for optics. So your glasses have uh, these thin coatings that help with uh, glare, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, our what's new about our system is uh, it's a low damage process. So in the solar industry, there are a lot of sensitive uh, solar cells who cannot resist the the plasma environment that that sputtering does and they're severely limited by the for those reasons and our hope is to uh, use this uh, this sputter process to deposit uh, well-known materials with low damage processes to make those cells more efficient okay so what would you say was uh, the one thing you learn, or m maybe not even you, but your whole team learned most from this project? Uh, engineering's difficult, and nothing goes together as you thought it would. So, like, you know. What you think would take a week uh, takes, like, three weeks. Yeah, so, you know, time management is a big thing, and yeah, just planning management. ahead for stuff like that. Okay. Um, what do you think was probably the most difficult pro part of this project? The most difficult part was uh, th those magnets were actually a real pain in the ass to, uh, to put in. But uh, meeting on time and regularly with your teammates is something that, that is it's a difficult to manage four schedules and get people in the same place at the same time. Yeah, that's definitely something that you'll probably take with you to um, industry. So. Um, is there anything that you would add to this project or you maybe wish you had a little bit more time so you could have um, done something else with it or something like that? Is there anything like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish uh, we had time to actually do uh, depositions with this equipment. So we were able to ignite a plasma, but there's a little process optimization you have to do to get the coating onto a piece of glass. And uh, it's something I hope to work on a little more in the, the coming months to, to get that working. Okay. Um, and then is there more, um, I guess, what, what would you do differently with this if, you know, knowing what you know now, if you started this project over again, is there something that, you know, you would do differently no, like now that you've been through the whole process? Uh, plastic prototypes for everything. Because when you're working with metal and you mess something up, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, so to go back and fix that mistake. So do like proof of concept with things that are more disposable or something, or just easier to work with? Yeah, no, okay. I think that's the right answer. Okay. All right, well, um, thank you for your time, and good luck with the rest of the presentation day. Cool, thank you.
right. Um, could you give us a little introduction of uh, what your team, who your team is, and then what you guys did? Okay. Yeah, my name is Christian Winsick, and then uh, our team was the Smike Bark Smart Bike Attachment. So we wanted to do a. Well, we'll pull it up right here. So basically, the problem is that one in seven bikes in universities are stolen. Mm -hmm. It's a really common problem, especially around the world. There's a lot of statistics. Almost every single bike is not recovered. So you, if your bike gets stolen, it's gone. So we want to prevent the theft before it happens. Another problem is that people don't, they're too lazy to lock up their own, their bikes. So over half of bikes that are stolen aren't even locked up in the first place. Uh -huh. So we wanted to create something for the people who are too lazy to lock up their bike as well as added security people who do lock up their bike. So the objective is make it cheap because there's other ones on the market that are too expensive. So we wanted to do cheap ones, especially for college students. So we wanted it to be cheap, we wanted it to be modern, use Bluetooth, and we wanted it to have automatically arming and disarming for people who don't want to lock up their bike every single day. Okay. And the solution was basically have an alarm with LEDs that flashes that alerts nearby people that the bike is being stolen to prevent the theft from happening. It attaches to the frame of the bike, you attach it, you uh, install it once, you leave it there, you just connect it with your phone on and off. So it's kind of like a car alarm then, Yeah, it's basically a car alarm okay. for a bike. That would be awesome. a good way to describe it. <coughs> So here's a picture of it right here. It has uh, all the components. You can see it's attached to the bike right now. Then we have a quick little demo as well right here. So we'll let this play. Right. So also, uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but it has a warning beep right there. So if you're just moving a little bit, it's going to have a warning beep. It does a few of those. But if you start actually moving it, the alarm changes with a different tone. And it just keeps going off. And that'll keep going off as long as the bike is moving. Okay. And if someone, if it's just, if it's chained up and someone sets off the alarm accidentally, it'll go off for a while, but then it'll turn itself off. Because we don't want it to keep going, especially if it's sitting outside a classroom or something. Right. We want it to stop eventually. But if they are moving with it, it's going to keep going off until okay, they stop. So it's it. kind of based on if it's moving or not, like yeah, the distance. Yeah, so it's basically a motion detector in here. Okay. We'll get into that. Basically, a motion detector. If it moves a certain amount, it'll uh, increment a value that says the bike's moving. Mm -hmm. If it gets to a certain value, it'll set off the warning. But if it keeps moving, it gets higher and higher. It's going to start setting off the alarm. Okay. And the components, so we had the 3D casing. We had a Bluetooth to connect it to the phone. We had the microcontroller to send all the signals, a battery pack to power it, the speaker, the alarms, and the LEDs just to alert everyone that the bike is being stolen. Mm -hmm. And as we said, we're trying to make it a low-cost thing. So the final cost was about $35. And that was using all development boards and units, which are more expensive. Mm -hmm. So our goal would be, if we were to mass produce this, bring it down to, say, 20 bucks. Okay. So make it uh, cheap and affordable for everyone to use. So what are the, how much do the ones that are currently on the market cost? So the ones that are currently on the market are, what, from what we were looking at, $100 minimum. And they go up to all the way up to like $200. Okay. So our goal was to sell this for maybe $50. And because uh, a normal U-lock is already $30. Mm -hmm. So this could be a replacement to a U-lock. Instead of spending $30 on the U-lock, you could spend 40 or 50 on this instead. Yeah. And it has more functionality as well. OK, cool. And then that's it for the presentation. Um, so after all of this uh, two semesters, what do you think was the most difficult part of your project? Uh, that would probably have to be just uh, learning how to work with the group and everything, getting everyone together, making sure we uh, budget our time and stuff so we can meet up together mm -hmm. to do the testing, uh, making sure we do stuff in advance because uh, issues did arise during this. Right. And if we didn't start in advance, we would have uh, been so far behind that it would have been hard to catch up. Mm -hmm. So making sure our mentor helped us with that to make sure we were staying on time and getting everything done beforehand and uh, just getting used to the scheduling and stuff would probably be the toughest. Okay. And. Do you think that, uh, what was the, I guess, the hardest uh, technical part of this? I would have to say uh, probably had to do with the gyroscope because it comes out in, uh, the values come out in like binary, they come out in one big address block. So you have to figure out how to break them down and get the individual measurements because there's, uh, I think there's eight measurements coming out of the gyroscope mm -hmm. in the X, Y, and Z direction. There's also acceleration as well. So we had to figure out how to get those values out and how to get them in a usable format. And they're also noisy, so we had to figure out how to filter them, basically, to make them not noisy so the, uh, the alarm's not going off on its own without anyone actually yeah. touching it. So yeah. that was the most difficult technical part. So do you think that's the part you learned the most about during this project, or was there something else that you really feel like you didn't know about before coming and doing this? Um, could you talk about that? Yeah, I'd say that was the biggest part. Uh, we use the Arduino, so they have their own 
uh, IDE. So we used just kind of learning about all that code was something that we had never done before because we do mostly cir analog circuits. So getting more to the digital side and actually learning how to code it, how to program it, how to send the signals when a certain event happens, and uh, learning how to make it so the uh, warning alarm goes off, just kind of programming it up so that it's smart and it's it's uh, an advanced bike lock. That was probably the toughest part. All right. Well, awesome. Sounds like a pretty cool project. Um, thanks for sharing it with us, and good luck with the rest of your presentation day. Right, awesome. Thank you. So, um, uh, could you introduce yourself and then uh, tell us about your project? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Martin Kinyanji Nongari. Um, uh, my, project, my project is about robotics for assistive technologies. Uh, the project is about uh, computer vision, uh, apl application of cloud computing, and generally uh, hardware, hardware development. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. What was like? What is the use of this in like society? Like, what is the application of this project? Uh, the application of th this project, and generally what we've been working on, is like developing uh, an auto drive car system uh, that is more safer and that I that applies uh, simpler technologies, and that is like uh, has a, a better setup and it is more understandable to the general society. So generally we're using the technology, imprinting it into vehicles and uh, making it sure that it can uh, read road signs and give an output. And that way we can save on human labor as well as uh, environment and sustainability issues. Okay. So is it, did you guys just do the software part, the programming part, or did you also incorporate, you know, like a little uh, mini car that can kind of show how it works or is it just you know software based so for this project it was like a, a big comp a big a big project and we divided it into different parts uh, okay. through our help of our mentor professor Lena Karam so there was a group that was doing the hardware part and there was a group that was doing the software part but eventually we came together and put all our parts together but me and my team were focused on the software part okay. developing the MATLAB code and well uh, testing it on uh, sampled images and seeing how it can detect but then the uh, printing uh, writing the code on the hardware was a different j job for a different team okay yeah. um, what would you say was the most difficult part of your project uh, the most difficult part of this project was generally uh, well it was uh, on specifics uh, so uh, like having the project run on high pixels and low pixels. So like uh, if you're testing this, pr this, this, this cameras, if they're high pixels and you're testing them on road signs, uh, the response will be slower. So like it will take like four seconds to respond. So for example, a car is driving and it takes four seconds to dis detect uh, a road sign, then you'll have, uh, then you'll have a problem, yeah. right? But generally we load, when we load our pixels, it will detect it faster. But then when we lower pixels, we end, we end up having problems in terms of bad weather conditions and yeah and uh, dis other distractors suppose there's something in front of the of the of the road sign then mm -hmm. it won't detect it 
accurately. Also, like uh, we used precision precision detection, so like the bonding box and the output out output box, and the percentage is supposed to be more than fifty percent. Uh, so if it's less than fifty percent, it will detect there's no road sign. But mm -hmm. if it's so, we made our threshold seventy percent so that it can be a guarantee that it has detected. So in a different case, whereby the road sign is not clear or the pixels are low, it will give a forty percent and not detect. So generally, our problems was uh, specifications on specifications and generally, the deliv the deliverables were kind of tricky to attain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think is the um, what did you learn the most out of this experience? Was it was it like a technical thing like coding or was it like more um, how to work with the team and time management and stuff like that? Uh, I'll say it was both. Generally when we walked into this project, uh, me, me and my team members weren't doing anything with computer vision. We were generally electrical engineering but we had experience in circuits, power management, yeah, mm -hmm. and more of more of like solid state. So, and for this project, we had to learn a lot of MATLAB coding, deep MATLAB coding, and we hadn't had much experience with that. Like we had little, but it was more of the mathematical side, mm -hmm. not more of the v graphic side. So generally the, uh, the coding part and also understanding the society perspective of the project. Uh, on, team, on, on team skills and well, my team members were quite cooperative. We always had weekly schedules. We met three times, so it was always beneficial in our research and development process. Okay, yeah. well, that's good. Not all teams are able to work yeah. uh, co cohesively together. Okay, well, um, that is uh, all the time we have for you, but mm -hmm. thank you for coming and sharing the project that you guys were working on all semester, or th this past year, yeah. and uh, good luck to you guys for the rest of your demo day presentation. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um. Okay. Um, if you could uh, tell us what your team is and what you guys did for your project. Fantastic. So my name is Francisco Medina, and my group members consist of uh, Gerardo uh, Ortega, Dorian Larios, and Naveen Najam. And we did a automated beer dispenser. Oh, that must be a popular project. <laughs> yeah, so far everyone's really, really liking it a lot. I mean, uh, we're getting uh, a lot of uh, people from different uh, groups within the actual capstone class. Additionally, we're getting people from, uh, how do I call it, from the advising offices asking a bunch of questions and really enjoying it. It's really, it was a really fun project. Okay, so could you go into more detail on, you know, what the project is and your process of getting to today? Oh, fantastic. Well, initially we decided to do essentially a fun project. We wanted to, we all decided it's like, well, we wanted to go around most of the disciplines within EE. Mm -hmm. And we decided that this particular project would be not only a fun one, but we can also uh, have more experience with, you know, power distribution, control systems, programming, and additionally some little like system level layout, I mean, excuse me, system level circuit design. So we can all have that together and then learn together and make it a really fun project. And uh, essentially from there, a bunch of research within uh, different uh, hardware, software, and so on, and then trial and error eventually, and then coming up to today, which we can actually dispense beer okay. and such. So do you have um, like a video of it working, or could you describe the process of how it works? Oh, of course. I can definitely describe the process. Um, this process essentially starts off with, um, how do I call it? Let me run through the slide very quick, and I can show you the actual final product of this guy. So uh, what we have here is going to be our robot arm with an encasing and an, an enclosure. And what happens is we have uh, designed a Bluetooth controller mm -hmm. to be able to interact with your uh, Android device. It's going to be able to send a bit of information from your phone to the Bluetooth device, which hooks up to the Arduino. Then we have to trip an IR reflective sensor with a uh, red solo cup because it has a really nice reflective index. Okay. And then from there, <laughs> What ends up happening is uh, the, the actual motor goes, tilts over, and pumps initiate, and then we start pouring the drink. Okay. Um, and 
how does it know know when you know the drink is done pouring is there like a sensor in there or is there how, how do you guys um stop once you know the cup is full and how do you tell between different size cups or Oh, we initially started to be, I would say, a little bit more easier on ourselves because we were initially thinking of putting a sensor, such as, for example, a, 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 excuse me, a, um, I don't know, a distance sensor, basically, mm -hmm. to see it's like, hey, you know what, at this distance, we should shut off the pumps in order to, be, to dictate that the actual cup is full. Okay. But we actually use a timer. Okay, okay. And so in this case, once the actual sensor is tripped, the cup is then, uh, once the sensor is stripped, the actual pump goes over and then under, under a certain duration of time, the pumps continue on pumping mm -hmm. and then filling up a certain basically cup. Like currently right now we're set up for nine ounces of tea. We actually have a tea of tea currently, obviously we can't really pour, uh, have alcohol on campus, right. but uh, <laughs> essentially we can increase the time, duration and so on to uh, fill up, let's say for example, 16 ounce glass mm -hmm. and so on. So. Uh, Beyond that aspect, um, and I'm sorry, what was the, the following question? It was, uh, how does it detect? Or? Oh, um, so I, I was just wondering if it had the capability of, you know, telling, um, like, what size uh, glass was there, like, if oh, it was, okay. like, 16 or 9 or something. Or know. something to that yeah. aspect. Yeah, this is basically purely towards going to be the programmer's end and just adding on to, it's like, hey, you know what, we, instead of doing a 9-ounce glass, we're going to be doing a 16-ounce glass. Mm -hmm. Then we already calculated the duration of time to which we will be able to pour that drink and make sure it's nice and full. Okay. And additionally, we also added some, uh, I guess you can say safety features uh -huh. to where if you, let's say for example, you pour your, your you send in your bit, you throw on your glass and you know, you know what, I'm gonna go take this off for a second and I'm going to go talk to a friend of mine very quick. Uh -huh. So what's gonna happen is we have a reset stage and as well as if you were to put your glass right back onto that sensor, it will continue filling up your glass right to the brim. It's right oh, to the so, so it'll keep track of how much time had already passed, and then it'll, okay. And then uh, you have that as well, and then afterwards, let's say for example, you go, uh, the, the conversation with your friend mm -hmm. takes a little bit longer than usual, then in which case, then it just resets and goes back home. Okay, awesome. Well, this sounds like a very fun and very practical <laughs> uh, project. I'm sure it would do pretty well on the market. But uh, thank you for coming in and sharing um, your project with us, and good luck to you for the rest of the day. I really appreciate it. Thank you very yeah, much. No problem. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, could you introduce yourselves and then what your project was and go into um, what you guys have done for the past year and uh, what you are showing today? Okay. Um, we are Team 43. I'm Heidi Benjamin. Kevin Mendes. And our third teammate is Hussein Mohammed. And our project focuses on the inspection of transmission lines using drones. So currently the um, Main methods are by foot, so some, some guy has to go out with a truck and binoculars and physically look at the lines and find any faults. Or they rent a helicopter, which can be expensive. Um, so ideally what our project would be is a drone with a camera would be able to go out and do those inspections instead of somebody physically having to do it. Um, the problem is even the best drones only fly 20 to 30 minutes. Right. And so 
Our project is to create a system that would allow the drone to actually recharge while in flight using the field generated by the power lines themselves. So that's kind of the overall basic part of our project. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so is there anything like this that is currently being used like uh, on the market or anything like that? Well, actually, uh, there there's utility companies that do use drones, but it's rare, rarely used. Uh, we we did research last semester about all the different inspection methods, um, but we didn't find anything like this. So we thought it was interesting to work more on this uh, and uh, figure out how we can solve the problem of the drone having a low battery life um, to, to to inspect the lines. Okay. And there are actually um, there are projects being worked on to use a drone where the, the product is being developed to inspect the lines using the drone. Um, that's already in development where I instead of a person having to do the checking for faults and stuff, the, the camera itself will pick it up and transmit that data. Yeah. So this would be kind of the next steps for those kinds of projects that are currently being um, worked on and implemented. Okay. So uh, what do you guys have here? And could you kind of explain what this whole circuitry is? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, at, so at the very beginning, uh, we'll have the drone flying. We have a U-shaped uh, core, and this will go under the drone while it's flying. And um, the conductor, the high voltage conductor, would uh, likely be under this U-shape. And the there will be an induced current uh, voltage that'll that'll be on the coils. Uh, and then that that um, that voltage will go through a transformer to step it down for uh, for the voltage. Um, that is suitable for the the battery, the drone battery, mm -hmm. uh, and after after the transformer is still AC, so battery is run on on direct current. So we have to we had to build a bridge rectifier that would um, convert the AC to DC, and it would go straight to the battery. Okay, and so now that you guys have worked on this for you know a whole year, what was like the most difficult part of this project? Do you think? Um, I think one of the main problems we had is getting a drone that was able to carry enough payload that could sustain a, an added system like this um, without completely killing the battery because the more it has to lift, obviously the faster mm -hmm. it's going to lose battery. Um, and so there are things that could be um, made more efficient, but something like our transformer, I mean, the transformers, that's about as small as we could get. And I mean, it is heavy because I mean, it is just by nature metal coils. So um, things like that to make the project actually feasible was hard to actually get it to, you know, like we couldn't actually yeah. put this on our drone and test it because I mean, our drone wouldn't have taken off the ground. So yeah. things like that were kind of difficult to, to work with, but um, the idea was there, I guess. Mm -hmm. So. What, what do you think you guys learned the most uh, from this, from, I guess, these past two semesters? Was it something technical, like, you know, the, how this circuitry works, or was it something more um, on, like, communication side, like scheduling or, you know, time management, something like that? Well, it was uh, basically both sides. Uh, the main technical parts, we did learn a lot about how, uh, you know, induction works and how you can convert every, uh, everything to um, like DC for the battery and then how inspection lines are, uh, the, how high voltage lines are inspected and the, uh, the different methods of drones. That's mm -hmm. the, everything, we did research the first semester and we learned a lot from that. Uh, uh, and the other, the other part is like we did work on our communication skills, our team building yeah. skills. And that was really important for us because we needed to uh, communicate to set up schedules and to meet with our mentor every week or every other week. Mm -hmm. um, those were pretty important things that we built upon during the, the course of this project. Okay. And if you had more time to work on this or you know, say like another semester or another year, is there anything that you would add to it or that you would want to add to it that could make it better? Um, or you wish that you had more time to um, so ideally, um, our circuit would have a voltage regulator, regulator that would monitor the battery so that we don't overcharge the battery. Um, we did not have time or um, resources to actually put that into our circuit, so that would be definitely something that would need to be added to our system. And also, um, one of the things our mentor was looking for was to not only have this, but also have 
um, the drone that could be not controlled by remote but by computers so that you don't have to be dependent on the remote. Because the, the idea of this is that you don't have to, right. you can move farther than the remote would allow. Mm -hmm. So the other part of the project was to create like a computer element of it so that you could control it by the laptop instead. So um, we did start some work on that side of it. So that would be definitely something that we could push further on. Okay. So Awesome. Well, thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you for showing us what you've done. And good luck with the rest of Demo Day. Thank, thank you. you.
so it gets to be on camera. All right, so I'm going to introduce you here real quick, and then you can go ahead and demonstrate. So are we on? All right, our next presentation is going to be by an online team. Go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your team and, uh, and your project. Right. My name is James Kokenauer. Uh, my teammates on this project are Thomas Wright and Jeremy Coghill. Our uh, project was an industry-sponsored project by Microchip. Our mentor is Garrett Scott. And this is an automatic drink mixer here. And we have this set up to where it operates using an LCD touch screen as an interface. And you can also operate it from a web-based app that you can control from your computer or a smartphone, like I'm showing right here. And basically, we have eight different fluids that we have on each side for these bottles. And they operate off of pumps. We have a uh, Raspberry Pi that we have set up to the user interface, that way this can connect to Wi-Fi, and then we have a PIC16, which was one of the parameters from Microchip to use for the project, and the Raspberry Pi uh, communicates with this and the serialized data across to the PIC, and that tells the pumps how long to operate to dispense the drinks, and we have a volume uh, flow rate determined with those, and uh, I can show you how everything works on here. So this touch screen, and uh, if you look at the, the poster that we have set up, because you can't see the screen particularly well because of the lighting, but on the poster, you can see what I'm doing here. And on the custom drink part, you have eight different bottles. And so like right here, I have it set up to where we have uh, yellow and blue, and this is just water with food coloring in it, but you can have any kind of uh, liquids in these. And I have set up for one and two to dispense. And then if I do this and create the drink, then those two fluids are going to come out. And from yellow and blue, we're making a green drink there in the bottom. And we also have this set up to where we have a photoelectric sensor back there. So that way, these drinks, it won't dispense unless there's something in the way. So like, for instance, if I used a web-based app for this one and just pick like a generic drink on here, I'm going to press that to dispense the drink, but it's not going to do anything unless the cup is in the way, and then it will dispense based off of the sensor. And so that's uh, kind of how everything works on it. And uh, if you have any other questions, then I'm ready to field them. OK. Um, what do you think was the most uh, difficult part of your project? Um, trying to coordinate with people with different schedules was challenging. Um, even during this semester, uh, one of our, my teammates, Jeremy, got a, a promotion to a different type of job and a lot of added responsibility. And then Thomas uh, did a, swi a shift switch to where he went from working one set of hours to another. Uh, I was also working a lot of hours, so, so it was hard to coordinate meetings sometimes to where we could actually have, you know, set up an hour or two to where we could collaborate and, and do all of that. And then... This is also a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Um, I've been in power, the power industry, for the last 17 years, and none of us had a ton of experience with programming mm -hmm. coming into this, so we were kind of on the, the ground floor going into it. But uh, you know, fortunately, the, the stuff that we've learned at ASU over the, the last few years helped prepare us to where we were able to operate outside of our comfort zone and, and make everything work all together. That's good. Um, so what do you think was the one thing you learned the most from this that um, you would take with you now to your future endeavors? You know, being able to, to work with a team of people that, you know, you're not in, you know, in-person contact with, I, I think that that's a really valuable experience. Uh, moving into the workforce, different jobs, and, and even what I do with, with engineering, uh, with power, I, I you know have to, to work with people on, on projects that, that I've never met uh, mm -hmm. in person, and, and so I think that's really valuable that we were able to you know go into this. We didn't know each other going into to this project, and so we were able to, to collaborate, meet each other, get along, and you know make make everything work uh, remotely. It's you know we learned in, in the class with the, some of the the stuff where you know working with four 
foreign markets and different things like that. And I think that working, you know, out of state and, and you know, even with foreign people, I mean, this is kind of valuable experience that can do you up for that. All right. Well, awesome. Well, thank you for um, sharing your project with us and good luck to you for the rest of Demo Day. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. So if you could uh, introduce yourself and then talk about your project and what you guys have what you guys have accomplished in the past uh, year. I'd love to. My name is Jeremy Johnson and I'm the part of team 44, the robotic leg brace. The robotic leg brace is all about mobility and the return of mobility. You see, many people have deterioration in their legs muscles. They can't move with it anymore without having physical therapy where they have to have assistance walking until they regain that muscle memory back. And that requires another person or a lot of expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make a very cheap part of a mechanical leg and trying to use that to help people move their legs, which would in turn allow them to have more independence, but also return them on the fast track to health. Okay. So what have you got, what are you guys uh, presenting out there right now um, for the demo presentation? What do you guys have? Right now we have a 3D printed leg. We have a motor attached to it, the circuitry, the Arduino, the battery. It's all almost connected. A lot of the parts broke off earlier on because of uh, you know weight problems. Okay. Uh, we are mechanical engineers, so this was. Yeah. <laughs> But all the programming sound. It's good. Um, what do you think was the most uh, difficult part of this project throughout the whole semester? Uh, most definitely the problematic part of the project was the mechanics of making a robotic leg. I really wish we could have gotten like a mechanical engineer and make like sort of a hybrid team, but there isn't like a hybrid for mechanicals in this thing, if I'm recalling correctly. There was just for an art thing. But definitely, we wanted more time to get into the mechanics. And the mechanics are something that we had to put a lot of time into. And being the last part of senior year, we just didn't have the time between work and school play. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I believe that the project was working for out of the sound one. OK. And what do you think you guys learned the most throughout? Or it doesn't have to be the whole team, but maybe you specifically. What did you learn the most out of this experience? Personally, getting involved with things like Arduino. Mm -hmm. Arduino was a big part of our project for programming the legs motors, programming the, the uh, well, it was a theoretical hydraulics that we didn't actually get into. We put a little bit of code in there for it, but we didn't actually get it to put it in. So we got the experience for it. That's just uh, good enough. We definitely got some real, uh, li real life uh, circuitry experience. Mm -hmm because in order to make a battery with 12 volts, move the motor and reverse it, required a lot of good circuitry knowledge. And it was great to brush up on that after a while. Yeah. Um, so if you could um, get you know more time to work on it, would the mechanical aspect be the thing that you would work on? Or is there any other features that you would like to add to this, uh, to this project that say if you had another year or another semester? Oh yeah, definitely the mechanics. I wanted to get a good gearbox going for the motor, make it more ergonomic, and maybe get that hydraulic in there if we got a little bit of time. But honestly, that's uh, a task and a half with uh, getting everything ergonomic. There's a whole ergonomics engineering that would probably tell me a lot at length about how to do that. But I definitely want to learn more about mechanics as an electrical engineer yeah. because a lot of things you do with electrical me engineering eventually turns into mechanics. Right. Okay. And so wh what about if you could start the project over again? Is there, is there any like adjustments that you would make knowing what you know now? Definitely getting the prototype done earlier. Uh, Professor Sakalis, our mentor, warned us about this, uh, especially during the first semester. but. We're uh, so on to just 
doing the projects we kind of laxed a little bit earlier on mm -hmm. when we could have gotten a kickstart even though we didn't have the fund return at the time mm -hmm. uh, that's what a lot of my other teammates were working for and I had a job so I didn't have actual time to go out and build all these things although I had the money I started putting money into certain things a uh, lot of a whole bunch of pieces of Home Depot yeah uh, but definitely getting that prototype done earlier, earlier than expected. Okay. Yeah. Earlier prototyping is always have like a little buffer for yeah. um, unexpected things. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and sharing what you guys have done this semester and good luck to you for the rest of demo day. Oh yes. Thank you. All right. So, all right, so introduce yourself and uh, your team and what you guys have been doing for the past year. Hi, my name is Brian Gagne. I'm part of Team 48, I believe. And uh, we were part of the General Dynamics uh, Mission System sponsored project to uh, build a neural network uh, using uh, millimeter wave scan images. Okay. Um, could you go into a little detail on, you know, how this works and what it's all about? Of course. Well, uh, essentially, uh, so this was a data science competition hosted on Kaggle, and they provided all of the APS files, which were the files read into the network. And our job was to pre-process these images, create an architecture, and kind of optimize that architecture to make new predictions on new APS files that were provided by our uh, mentor eventually in the second semester. So. It's uh, easier if I was able to run through all the code, but essentially we uh, programmed it on PyTorch, and uh, just through trial and error, blood, sweat, and tears, we were able to uh, get a model that accepted the input and was able to produce a uh, output that was around 70% accurate, which are, we are extremely proud with. That is, that's pretty cool. So you said this was a part of a competition, correct? Were you guys able to enter into the competition and w was the 70% like really good within the competition? Or? So uh, uh, <laughs> this is a funny story. So in December, uh, it was actually the competition ended last semester, but we were working on our back in the back in the day, we were a group of seven people. And I believe you may have interviewed one of the other members earlier, but we split into two groups at the second semester, but we were working on our uh, on our network for about a week straight, trying to get the uh, final submission in. But uh, it turns out that we had the wrong submission deadline, and it was the week beforehand. Oh. So we missed out on the opportunity to actually submit it into the competition. But oh. uh, anyway, but the, our model, unfortunately, there are a lot of good data scientists out there, and they probably would have beat us anyway. So oh. okay. it's <laughs> high Well, I mean, point. yeah. You never know. You guys could have, uh, you know, been like a dark horse. But um, so what do you think was the most difficult part of this project? Just so uh, with all the neural network architectures that are out there, most of them are, are it's very easy to use with JPEG three layer images. And a lot of data sets are you can just preload them in. There are a lot of helper functions that are available for that versus this project that really wasn't available. And we're a group that didn't have a ton of Python coding experience. We pretty much just kind of had to delve into Stack Overflow and do it all ourselves. But eventually, getting the uh, input to be a successful input and run through the network with all the layers and sorting through each key error and everything, that was definitely the hardest part because coding is fun until it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, coding can be very frustrating. So would you say that the coding part was the part that you guys learned the most about because you said you didn't really have that much Python experience beforehand or was it something more on you know the soft skills like communication or something like that? So uh, I would say, I mean, teamwork and communication in a project is always important. I felt like I got really lucky with my group members because I felt that we were all we were on the same page from the start. Mm -hmm. I would say that about 60 to 70 percent was learning how to code, and the other 20 to 10 percent, I'm whatever numbers I'm using now, yeah. they uh, that would would have been understanding machine learning and understanding what we would want this code to do and understanding the fundamentals of what we were trying to accomplish. 
And so now that you've gone through this project and you have your final product, if you were to say start over knowing what you know now, what is something or multiple things that you would do differently to, you know, kind of speed along the process or something like that, or you could use in future projects? So knowing what I know now, it's kind of, I don't know. I felt like, I mean, the, the journey, the path to how we got here, I don't think it could have been any different, but just knowing what we know now, definitely it would just be so much more streamlined. It would, we would be able to actually optimize our network a lot more and focus on the architecture versus trying to make it work. Okay. I just felt like we ran out, we ran out of time because for the longest time it was getting the input and creating a, a network that actually outputted results mm -hmm. instead of fine tuning this network and optimizing it. But just to be here and be able to show a final product is more than enough for me. All right, cool. Well, thank you for coming and showing us what you've done this semester and good luck with the rest of the demo day out yeah, there. Thank you.